Okay. Next lecture uh, in the introduction to semiconductor to solid state physics. Um, and uh, today we're going to put to use the knowledge we've developed uh, not only about the basic solids and crystal mm. structure, but about particular materials, semiconductors. Uh, you all know they're very important materials. Uh, it is something like a, a $300 billion industry, the semiconductor industry. So all the microchips that they're making at Intel and other uh, companies, uh, it's a big industry. It's also very important uh, in our daily lives. Uh, and uh, it can actually, from the physics point of view, can be boiled down to a few concepts uh, which I will present to you today. Of course, the discussion can be infinitely long about the physics of semiconductor devices. It could be a separate course or even a, a full several year curriculum. Uh, but today we're going to just spend one lecture on the main, most important concepts. Um, It turns out when you want to build devices out of semiconductors, uh, you almost every time will be wanting to put several different materials together, make a connection between them. And uh, uh, such structures are called uh, junctions. So a junction between, let's say, one semiconductor and another, a junction between a metal and a uh, semiconductor. Uh, and uh, there are several main types of such junctions, and the first uh, one I'm going to discuss today is a hetero junction, a heterostructure. A heterostructure is a prominent building block for semiconductor devices. It, it is also a wonderful achievement in physics and in material science that we can produce heterostructures. What is a heterostructure? It is when you put two different materials together. Hetero comes from two different ones, different ones. Heterostructure. Uh, so layers of two or more different semiconductors. Uh, and uh, one thing that uh, might happen if we put two very different semiconductors together is a band structure like this, like in the picture uh, in the upper right. Here, two materials, gallium arsenide and germanium, have two different band gaps. And therefore, we're going to have a situation where in gallium arsenide, the band gap is larger than it is in germanium. Okay? So we will see what kind of uh, interesting things we can build with such, a, with such a unit. But at least this much uh, should be clear, that two materials with two different gaps, put them together, there will be some kind of a jump in the gap as you go along um, the material. Uh, now, um, it is actually not that simple to put two different materials together such that we could talk about this uh, very simplified uh, band structure, band picture going along the x direction, uh, along the uh, perpendicular to the junction. Uh, there has to be a very smooth, uh, atomically sharp interface between the two materials. If you just take two pieces of semiconductor, slap them together, uh, you know, they were in air and uh, God knows what is on the surface. You put them together, it's not going to be an atomically sharp uh, surface. So, um, so uh, special, very... Um, uh, high-end uh, uh, growth techniques were developed where you start with one semiconductor and you grow it layer by layer and then you grow another layer on top. And those kind of structures only work very well when there is a good match between the semiconductors. Now what does this match, match entail? It entails a match of the two crystal lattices. So for example if the two materials have exactly the same a, exactly the same lattice constant, then you can imagine that you have atoms of gallium arsenide and then they smoothly go into the atoms of germanium uh, and all the atoms are along the same rows and that is a very good situation. And so there are several examples of such matches such as 
between aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide. That's a very common combination used in all kinds of devices that we're going to see today. Indium arsenide, gallium antimonide, that's a infrared applications. And some of the new renewed interest in this is in the, this new field of topological science. Gallium phosphide and silicon are per, almost perfectly matched. And these uh, zinc selenide is matched to gallium arsenide, for example. So these are all good combinations. What happens if there is a mismatch in the lattice constants? Who can guess what happens as you go, as you try to grow one material on top of the other and the atoms don't fit? You're going to get defects, right. So there will actually, you can model it, understand it as strain. There's going to be strain imposed by one material on the other. Because one material, let's say, uh, gallium arsenide will want the other material. Let's say it's not germanium, which is good, a good match, but it's something like indium arsenide or silicon with a different lattice constant. Gallium arsenide will want silicon to conform to the lattice constant of gallium arsenide. And so it will be either stretched or pulled apart by forces uh, at the interface. And so this strain will build up and build up until it's too large, and then there's going to be a skipped atom. It's much like you, you're biking on your bike, and then you exert too much torque, and then the chain skips. So there's going to be an atom that's skipped, and there's going to be defects. And this perfect band structure will not be so perfect, because there will be some, uh, each defect will produce an eigenstate somewhere in the wrong place, or the gap will fluctuate, or this boundary will fluctuate. However, assuming you can produce a perfect heterojunction, there are still um, various situations possible in terms of how these band gaps arrange. And this is determined by uh, materials parameters such as a work function, so uh, the energy to escape from the material for, a, for an atom and for an electron. Uh, and these things are, involve some fairly sophisticated calculations. And we're not going to get into this, but these are the three basic situations. The one shown in this picture. The first one is the, I think it's called type 1 band alignment. Uh, it's when the larger gap fully encompasses the smaller gap. And so that's um, so one of the most common situations. However, it's also possible that there is a band offset. And so you have a situation like this where the bands are um, not one fully inside each other, but the smaller band, smaller gap extends beyond the higher band. And so this, is, this you have to know when you design your device because the operation will depend on which type of alignment you can have. And there can also be a broken gap. Uh, and so, for example, if you, in this case of the broken gap, uh, there is an obvious problem that you're going to have. You don't have actually a gap here because these holes here are at the same energy as these electrons here. And so you can actually have a current all the way through this junction uh, in this broken gap part. OK, so I want to spend a couple of moments highlighting how, how it grows, how this is possible. So this is an example of a good match. Uh, combination from the previous slide, gallium arsenide and germanium. And uh, this is where the interface is. So there is some contrast. But what you can see in this picture is atomic rows projected, uh, just going completely smoothly from gallium arsenide into germanium. And this is called an epitaxially grown thin film. So this is a. Um, image that's obtained by a high resolution TEM, which stands for transmission electron microscope. And so it sends electrons at very high uh, energies, something like hundreds of kilovolts, maybe 300 kilovolts, all the way through the structure. And the pixels that you see here in this high resolution represent not the single atoms, but atomic uh, rows, atomic uh, 
And so this is a, a picture that uh, tells you about the crystallinity of the interface. Uh, so if, if there are any defects, then the dots will be misplaced, uh, or there will be a missing one, or they will be shifted. If it, that's called a dislocation. If one row is shifted with respect to the other, that's a dislocation. Uh, and th these pictures show, uh, to my eye, I'm not an expert on TEM, but to my eye, they show a perfect, perfectly grown structure. Now, how are these uh, kind of structures produced? They are produced in the MBE machines, which stands for molecular beam epitaxy. And what this machine does is it generates molecular beams, and then uh, they grow in this epitaxial, so uh, epitaxial means layer by layer, single crystal. Uh, this is how the machine, uh, an actual machine looks. This is actually, a, you know, looks uh, pretty advanced, but this is a university level tool. So uh, industrial ones can be even more complicated. Uh, it is a stainless steel vacuum chamber. Uh, so there's ultra high vacuum inside. And that's a very important ingredient uh, of the whole process, this ultra high vacuum. Uh, and all these um, uh, things that stick out are either um, guns, they're called diffusion cells, that uh, create molecular beams, or they are various detectors. And there is an extensive uh, transfer arm uh, manifold and so on. Um, so this is what's inside the chamber. Um, you have to have some kind of way of loading your uh, specimen inside, and it goes here. And this is called a substrate. So substrate is uh, the base on which you grow an epitaxial thin film. And then here, on, around the circumference, you have these things that are called effusion cells. Uh, effusion cells are buckets containing different materials, such as gallium, arsenic, arsenic silicon, uh, and so on. And they are preheated to a set temperature at which these uh, uh, materials sublimate. So atoms start coming out of the solid of the, um, of the material. Uh, and then, um, you know, when you um, put a, a pot with a liquid on a stove and you heat it up, uh, you're going to start having some vapor coming off, right? Uh, so this is uh, evaporation. Uh, and this evaporation takes the form of vapor, uh, which is a chaotic motion of uh, liquid molecules that were in the liquid. Uh, that's because we have air above this, uh, this pot. Uh, here we have ultra-high vacuum. And so uh, atoms that leave the effusion cell don't have anything to scatter with until they reach the substrate. And therefore, they go in straight lines. So you evaporate these atoms, you, you sublimate them, and they go in straight lines until they hit something which is, in our case, a substrate. So there is a mean free path of these is enormous in this chamber. Um, and so this uh, allows to create very well collimated, uh, perfectly um, pure beams, molecular beams or atomic beams of different elements. For example, you want to grow gallium and arsenide, fire up two of these effusion cells, one for gallium, uh, one for arsenic, uh, and create two beams that will overlap and grow a gallium arsenide film. What about detectors? Um, this guy here is a reed gun, uh, which I will explain in a moment. It can actually help you monitor how the film grows layer by layer. Uh, meaning epitaxially. So this is something you're also uh, at the conceptual level already familiar with because this is a uh, electron diffraction tool. Uh, so we didn't really discuss electron diffraction. We discussed uh, diffraction of x-rays and a little bit neutrons. But conceptually, electron diffraction is the same except this reflection uh, diffraction. It, the way it works is electrons don't really penetrate very far into the specimen. They just reflect off the surface and they, diff they give a diffraction pattern due to whatever is on the surface. And so yeah, they're extremely sensitive to the, to the top layer. So they, they get shot at the sample 
like this, and they reflect and they uh, hit a fluorescent screen on which you have then a diffraction pattern reflecting, which can be a set of lines or a set of dots, depending on whether, if it's a two-dimensional uh, sample, you will get a set of lines. If it's a three-dimensional structure, uh, you will get dots. Um, and this is all happening while you're growing. So here is gallium arsenide being grown. Gallium and arsenic beams are coming. And you are monitoring this diffraction. And the intensity of this diffraction pattern actually oscillates. Uh, and by the number of these oscillations, you can count how many single atomic layers you have grown. And so you can grow some gallium arsenide. And then you could switch, turn these off, and switch to germanium and then continue growing with germanium, and then you will have a perfect uh, atomically sharp transition from several layers of gallium arsenide and then to germanium. So this is how uh, this uh, read works. Um, who can tell me which language this is? Dutch, that's right. I, I took these slides from my previous uh, place where I worked, and uh, they, they were in, in Dutch. Um, OK. A anyhow, it is clear what is meant here, new layer. Uh, new layer gives a good uh, diffraction maximum at a certain position on the screen, right? There is a diffraction pattern, gives a diffraction maximum. Then when you start adding uh, a, a bit, bits and pieces of the next layer, so atoms uh, come down and they start filling up the next layer, you can see that there are different diffraction conditions at different places along the layer. And therefore, uh, the intensity of the diffraction signal will actually reduce. Uh, and uh, when actually the, when the uh, new layer is half formed, it is at the minimum because the, the top surface and the bottom surface, which is just one layer below, will interfere destructively. Uh, that's how read energy is chosen. Uh, energy of these electrons is chosen in such a way that just one atomic layer gives you the sensitivity. So the, this will interfere destructively, and there will be a minimum. And then as you start filling up, uh, it will come back to you know, the following layer uh, has been grown. Uh, and uh, for those of you who need to brush up on your Dutch, uh, this means time. Um, and the interference uh, becomes maximum again. So this is not a uh, read in this case is not used to figure out the crystal structure, but just to count the layers. But you can actually get even more information from read if you study the pattern in detail along the lines of what we've been learning from X-ray diffraction. So you can also tell uh, what is the crystalline symmetry of this film and so on. Okay. So this is a very uh, sophisticated technology, uh, MBE, uh, and it can produce all kinds of structures. Uh, one of the um, common ones is called a quantum well. And it is called this way because it is a potential well for particles, electrons or holes in a semiconductor. Um, it involves, in this realization that I show you here, involves two heterojunctions, from gallium arsenide to aluminum gallium arsenide uh, in going two ways. So it's aluminum gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide. Uh, you can grow the structure in an MBE machine by switching around aluminum and gallium atoms. Uh, and uh, it will, this is all perfectly lattice matched. So as you go along one row of atoms, you will be seeing a lot of aluminums around you, and then it will just be all galliums for a bit, and then aluminums again. But uh, it will be a, a, as if it's a otherwise a perfect crystal. Um, band gap of aluminum gallium arsenide, uh, and obviously you have to specify how much aluminum uh, you put in gallium arsenide, uh, so maybe something like 30%. So it will be aluminum 0.3. Gallium 0.7. Sorry, the pen fails at these low, small scales. Um, the band gap of gallium arsenide is smaller. So if you go, f if you start substituting galliums with aluminums, band gap grows like this, and that creates a 
uh, type one band alignment in which you have then created a potential trap for both electrons and holes in this middle land layer that is sandwiched between the higher energy levels. So that's a quantum well. Uh, just to remember that uh, looking from the top here, this will be a two-dimensional surface. So this quantum well is actually a two-dimensional layer in which electrons are localized. Uh, so they cannot go up or down. They are stuck in this layer. If you choose D to be small enough that the wave packet of an electron the wavelength of an electron uh, in this material is larger or equal to d, then electron, lives in, electron wave function lives in this entire quantum well. Right, so you can work out what this, let's say, de Broglie wavelength is of this electron. You know a Fermi velocity, um, and you know uh, the mass, the effective mass of the electron here. And it turns out that in semiconductors, uh, the wavelength of these electrons can be tens of nanometers. Right, so um, fairly large. So it spans many, many atoms, this kind of wavelength. So you can you can should think about a particle, an electron in this uh, in this semiconductor in gallium arsenide as occupying the volume of 10 by 10 by 10 nanometers or, or 20 by 20 by 20. Uh, something like this. This is also because the density of electrons is very low in these semiconductors, right? So uh, in principle, uh, intrinsically pure gallium arsenide should, is supposed to have zero electrons at low temperature. Uh, with them thermally activated electrons, there could be some density, but then they will be very, very sparse. And uh, if you count the number of electrons to the number of atoms, that ratio can easily be a million or even a billion. Uh, and that will tell you that you know, there's one electron per million atoms, and so that's uh, for even from that calculation, you get tens of nanometers volume per electron. Okay. All right. So um, because the wavelength of this particle is comparable to the dimensions of the quantum well, uh, that means that uh, it is a particle in a box problem for us, right? So we already know uh, how to deal with this. Uh, these electrons will only be allowed to occupy discrete energy levels in this quantum well. So here they are shown, uh, discrete energy levels. Uh, now, there is a nuance here related to what I told you that uh, if we look in this direction, it is a one-dimensional quantum well, but the other two dimensions are not restricted. In the other two dimensions, it is a free particle. So it, can, it is restricted in z, but it can go in x and y anywhere it likes. Because this is the energy axis, not the spatial axis, right? So if I plot it in space, it is a two-dimensional layer. So uh, in the other two dimensions, it's a free particle, so it has a parabolic dispersion relation. But in z, it has discrete energy. So the full energy uh, for this electron will be this quantum energy in Z plus H bar squared, Kx squared plus Ky squared divided by uh, 2m effective. So it is a discrete level plus a free particle in X and Y. Uh, now, uh, you can see that this is a parabolic dispersion relation nonetheless, just the z, z dimension is restricted by this formula. Uh, and so it is kind of like having bands, right? It's kind of like having bands. So you start from uh, the discrete energy levels, the quantization in z, but in x and y, you have to get the full dispersion relation, you have to add a parabola. Now, because these are very much like bands, but they are created by confinement, by quantum confinement, in this band structure of gallium arsenide, they are called subbands. Okay? That's the name for these things. So these are called subbands.
All right. Quantum well. What can you do with a quantum well? For example, you can build a semiconductor laser. Uh, that's not the only way to build a semiconductor laser, but this is a, a very efficient, high, um, high quality subset of semiconductor lasers that are called quantum well lasers. You recall what laser, how the laser works. Uh, laser that works on gas, like a helium neon laser, uh, uh, takes advantage of atomic transitions in the gas, and uh, you use some kind of a pump to, to bring all the atoms into the excited state, and then they relax and emit photons, all of the same energy. And then there should also be some kind of a mirror structure to boost this process to keep it going. So that's how a, a standard laser works. In a semiconductor laser, uh, you do this pumping by uh, sending an electrical current through. So this is a neat thing, and that's why you have a laser pointer, then uh, you just need to, to have a piece of semiconductor in there and a battery. You don't need to have a gas cell uh, and uh, another light source to pump up the atoms. So this, is, this makes it very convenient and make, ensures widespread application of lasers. Uh, so uh, when we stick to quantum wells, uh, this is how a laser works. Imagine that this is a semiconductor structure with a quantum well, uh, and we start putting electrons on the on the on the on the conduction uh, into the conduction band, so we make a contact to it and hook it up to a battery and start trying to send current. It's trying to shoot electrons into this conduction band. Electrons fall onto this level, this discrete level in a quantum well, and then they relax and become holes, and they emit a photon. So actually, it's not what happens because. Uh, in fact, what happens is electron comes from this side, hole comes from this side, which means it's just you have an electrical current going through. Right? And then electron and hole annihilate each other and make a photon. Right? So electron doesn't really fall, but you should think about it in terms of quasi-particles. And then electron, hole, electron comes from this side, hole comes from this side, and you get these photons. Then you need to build some, some mirrors uh, uh, out of different refraction of index uh, semiconductors produced also epitaxially to make it into a high efficiency laser. Here is another modification of this idea because we don't have to grow a single quantum well. We can just put our MB reactor to work and make a sequence of quantum wells by changing from gallium arsenide to aluminum gallium arsenide to gallium arsenide to aluminum gallium arsenide. And we can bias them all up with the voltage to line them up like this. And that's called a quantum cascade. The reason why that's called a cascade is because you can see what's going on with this electron. It just falls to the next level, and it does it several times, and that uh, creates several, several photons along the way. So the passage of a single electron creates all these photons. And so this is a much more efficient, efficient laser, but both, this is just a sort of a concept, uh, and a quantum cascade laser is what is actually a technology that being... Uh, actively developed right now. So one last picture from the MBE. Uh, this is a heterostructure between gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide the, in the transmission electron microscope image. One semiconductor gives a slightly higher contrast than the other. This is not a high resolution picture, so you don't see the individual atoms here, but you see the different layers as they stack up, and uh, this is what uh, MBE can do, for example, to generate a quantum cascade laser, right, to create a structure, a structure of this complexity. So needless to say, these kind of materials are n simply not naturally occurring, right? You cannot just dig it out of a mine. We are creating new materials that are unavailable before, and that's the power of heterojunctions. Okay, one more example of a heterojunction is a field effect transistor. This particular one is called high electron mobility transistor. Uh, that's because uh, these kind of semiconductors like gallium arsenide have a very high electron mobility. Um, the structure in color here, yellow, green, and uh, beige, 
Uh, that's a quantum well structure. So there is a bottom layer, top layer, and the green layer is the spacer, which uh, uh, green layer is where you have the two-dimensional electron gas. Um, this particular design is for a two-dimensional electron gas. It just occurs at the interface of two materials due to some band bending. Don't want to really get into those details. Just think about this structure as a quantum well, for example, like the one I showed you before, where electrons are confined to a green layer. And now in this, in this picture, you can see it in 3D that this is a two-dimensional green layer sandwiched between some other layers. Okay? Now, transistor is an electrical circuit element that is commonly used in all kinds of applications, from radio to computers, memory, uh, and so on. And the three terminals of a field effect transistor are called source, drain, and gate. Source and drain are easy to explain. Uh, they are what, they, what the words say. A source for electrons and a drain for electrons. Uh, not so easy to uh, explain how electrons get from the source into the 2-deg. There are different uh, ways to do it. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry, I used the word 2-deg. So uh, the, the electrons in a quantum well, because they are confined in one dimension but they are free to go, are often referred to as a two-dimensional electron gas. Okay. So it is a, uh, an object that I will come back to after your midterm when we study some more of the more recent physics. So I'm already happy to flash it for you, highlight this for you now. Um, so this is, a, this is a word that we are going to use uh, later on. Um, and these source and drain, they are, for example, metals or a highly doped semiconductor. So you need some kind of a, uh, another kind of junction here, a junction that allows transfer of these electrons into the quantum well. So sometimes it is just uh, done by annealing. So you take a metal and you heat it up and atoms of metal diffuse uh, all the way down to the two deg layer, to the green layer. and uh, thereby creating essentially an extremely highly doped semiconductor with very low resistance path to it. So source and drain are making an electrical contact to the two-dimensional electron gas, meaning it's an ohmic contact. There is an Ohm's law describing this contact. So resistance is proportion, uh, resistance, uh, voltage is proportional to current. Now this third contact is different. It's a gate. It is more like a capacitor. So electrons living in this gate uh, cannot jump onto the green layer. Uh, there is a dielectric gap. So there is, a, there is a little difference here between source and drain. There is this extra layer there they're showing here that uh, is part of that. Uh, what these gate electrons do is a very simple thing. They form essentially a capacitor with a layer of 2 deck directly underneath the gate. So you apply a voltage on the gate. So you apply voltage to this third terminal here. You apply voltage on the gate. And if you apply negative voltage, that voltage repels electrons from underneath the gate. If you apply a positive voltage, that voltage attracts more electrons underneath the gate. So uh, if you make a very, very negative voltage, then you can have absolutely no electrons here and the conduction path from source to drain becomes broken. If you make a very positive voltage, then current flows and you can have a very high current if it is a high mobility transistor like this one. Um, so uh, this is the principle of any transistor operation. A third electron electrode, third electrode controls the current flowing between source and drain. So this, this uh, can provide, for example, amplification. Uh, if you imagine putting a very small signal on the gate and that results in a very large current enabled through, that's amplification. Uh, you can also build logic circuits, and I'll show some of them to you uh, when we talk about a slightly different transistor called a MOSFET later on today. OK, uh, so uh, can someone name me another example of a 2 deg? Sure. What, about, what if you just went to this course <laughs> and didn't go to any physics lab? 
And what did we what did we discuss recently, like two days ago? Graphene, right? So graphene uh, is has something in common with this uh, with this green layer. Uh, even though this green layer is many many atoms thick, I just motivated for you that the wave function of an electron occupies the entire layer, and uh, uh, so in this sense. This is a two-dimensional material because electrons cannot jump over each other through the third dimension. They are all wave packets uh, blocking the entire Z. And in graphene, it is uh, by default like that because there is only one layer of atoms, and the electron, there are free electrons that are free to move there. And so that's also a two-deck. Now, a question. Does this work with graphene? Can we make a field effect transistor with graphene? So imagine this green layer is graphene. I sandwiched it between some dielectrics. I put contacts. I put a gate. Will it work as I described it to you? You apply voltage on the gate, and the current stops. Who thinks? No. One person, two, three, four. Why? <laughs> Just a gut because feeling. That's a gap between the two bands. Yeah, yeah. Is there a gap? No. There is no gap, right. So that's, that's, the, that's the key. Uh, so this is the difference between uh, something like gallium arsenide and graphene. Um, if I apply gate voltage to this uh, um, semiconductor band structure, what I'm doing is I'm changing the chemical potential in the uh, conduction band, for example. If, if, it's an, uh, if, it's a, if that's where the Fermi level was, I'm going to remove the electrons, and therefore I'm going to lower the Fermi level, so I'm going to change the chemical potential. When, it is, when, it is a, when we talk about chemical potential in the presence of some kind of electric fields, we talk about an electrochemical potential. Okay, so we sometimes call it electrochemical potential. So I'm going to be lowering this as I make the gate more negative until I reach this point where there is no, no more electrons, but there is also there is a gap. So no conducting carriers. This is graphene. So I'm, I'm lowering the Fermi level. I reach this red point, which is called the Dirac point. Uh, and then I just smoothly go, keep going, and uh, I get a bunch of holes. So this is what people actually measure when they try to make a field effect transistor in graphene. So this, this dark purple structure here is a single layer of atoms, graphene. And by the way, this is just a microscope picture. Uh, could be an electron microscope picture, but still, you can see a single layer of atoms. Because it is sitting on a silicon oxide, uh, and there is a gate underneath. So silicon is highly doped, and so the substrate works as a gate. So there is a large gate underneath. La third electrodes underneath. There are six electrodes here, but we can just try to pass a current from any one of them to the other. And this is what we measure. So uh, this zero voltage point is the Dirac point. And indeed, actually, resistance does go down linearly. That's because you have fewer states available for transport. But it does not go to zero. So it does not reach zero. There is still a small current flowing. And that's because there is no gap in graphene. So naturally, people have spent a lot of effort trying to open up a gap in graphene. So create a gap in graphene. Create a band structure that looks more like this and to make these transistors work better. So who can tell me one way to open up a gap in graphene? Right, if you roll it, or if you cut it very, very finely, right, uh, like for a nanotube. So if you make graphene into a nanotube, you can find such rolling vector where the gap will open. And so one of the approaches to opening a gap in graphene is to replace this uh, sort of bulk graphene uh, with a nano ribbon of graphene. So a very narrow strip of graphene, and then quantum confinement in that strip will open up a gap. Uh, but there are also other ways uh, to do it. 
Okay, moving on. Uh, this is another element that you can make many, many devices from. And this is uh, not a hetero junction. Uh, it is a junction between differently doped regions of the same semiconductor. So most commonly, silicon. You have a silicon crystal, but what happens if, what changes when you go along the junction axis, so perpendicular to the junction, is the doping of the material. So you put together regions of N-doped silicon and P-doped silicon. And so remember, in N-doped silicon, we have, for example, these uh, phosphorus atoms which bring extra electrons, and so there is a higher density of uh, electrons there. And in P-doped, uh, for example, with bismuth, with boron, uh, there are extra holes. So there is one missing electron for boron, and um, you have holes. Okay. Now, this is already a device, and it's called a diode. And the notation for the diode is this. Anybody familiar with PN junctions? Okay, good. So I will, uh, I will be efficient in discussing them, but I think it's still very good to discuss them. Um, just a recap from a couple of lectures ago. Uh, this is what happens in terms of the energy diagram. Uh, if we just have uh, an N-doped silicon, then uh, the chemical potential will move from the middle of the gap into the conduction band. So here, chemical potential is here. Uh, if we just look at the P-doped uh, piece of silicon, the chemical potential is towards the bottom of the gap, towards the valence band. Now what happens, we put the two together and make a very nice junction between them. What will happen is there will be a high chemical potential here, low chemical potential here, so some of the particles from this side will want to go here. Right? This is a basic diffusion theory, basic thermodynamics. They are going to want to do that. And so while... Initially, you have this kind of a situation. So you have a majority carrier, minority carrier. In both cases, you can have some electrons, some holes, for example, with thermal activation. But you have a majority N carrier on the N side and a majority P carrier on the P side. And that gradually uh, changes as you go across the junction. So you can actually model these junctions in terms of these concentrations of majority and minority carriers. I'm going to skip that. That goes more, in the, more deeply into the device phenomenology than I would like to go today. But at the conceptual level, uh, this is the key uh, feature of the PN junction, is the presence of this depletion region. So what is this for, about? Um, here is a junction between N and P at time equals zero, meaning we took somehow two pieces of semiconductor, n-doped and p-doped, and we stuck them together. And that's time equals zero. Uh, now, remember that both of them are electrically neutral. Uh, even though I'm showing all these minuses and pluses here, uh, what I'm not showing is that there are nuclei which have the corresponding opposite side. So for the uh, n-doped one, there for each minus, there is an equal plus from the nucleus. And so the piece of semiconductor is neutral. Uh, However, uh, carriers are going to want to diffuse because they have a higher chemical potential on the left. They will going to want to go to the right to equilibrate the chemical potential. But that's going to leave some nuclei uncompensated. So some of the nuclear charges are going to be uncompensated, and they are going to be positive charges on the left, and they're going to be negative charges on the right. And they, this will happen around the junction. That's where there will be some uncompensated nuclei because those electrons are going to want to travel to the whole side. And then uh, after some time, this will actually prevent further diffusion of charges. This will prevent all of these guys from going there. And the reason is because there is going to be an electric field due to uh, nuclei pointing this way. So they create an electric field this way, and ele this electric field is going to push positive charges that way, positive charges to the right, 
negative charges to the left. And when that electric field is strong enough, this diffusion process will stop. But there will be a region of substantial uh, width where there are no free carriers, only ions, only uh, nuclei. That's called the depletion region. And uh, the operation of the diode is uh, all about the manipulation of this region. So, for example, uh, what if you apply the so-called reverse bias? So, reverse bias means that you apply a positive voltage to the N side and negative voltage to the P side. Uh, it will become clear in a moment why this is called reverse bias. Uh, but for now, if you apply a positive voltage here, you're going to just grow this depletion region. You're going to strengthen the electric, you're going to add up to the electric field here, uh, and you will even stronger suppress any possible current that might flow through this device. Uh, so uh, no current will flow here, or very small current, uh, because the depletion region will only grow and prevent any current from passing through. So you're connecting a battery to this thing, but current cannot go. <clears throat> so before I explain the forward bias, I want to talk about the energy diagram uh, in the uh, unbiased case. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have N here and P here. Um, and um, the energy representation of this process of uh, creating a depletion layer and equilibrating the chemical potentials is this kind of situation. So uh, by the end of the day, once uh, all the diffusion stopped, you're going to have the same Fermi level everywhere in the device. So we just draw it as a straight line. But far away from the junction, here and here, we know where the Fermi level wants to be. Far away from the junction, Fermi level wants to be close to the bottom of the conduction band on the N side and close to the top of the valence band on the P side. So that's far away from the junction. And what that means is that in the depletion region, bands are going to tilt like this. This is also easy to understand from the fact that there is an electric field applied in this region. So there is an electric field applied here. And so to the chemical potential, uh, you are going to have to add to the energy of electrons in this region as a function of uh, x. You're going to have to add, uh, let's say, we talk about the conduction band level here far away as Ec. Uh, so then the electrochemical potential of electrons being in this band will have to also add the term which is proportional to the, uh, this potential energy from the electric field. And so this this E phi creates this slope. So bands line up like this. So in, in reverse bias, we only make this situation worse uh, by creating an even larger uh, discrepancy between N and P. So in this situation, all the electrons are piled up here. And all the holes are piled up here. And um, in the uh, um, reverse bias, we are making it like this. We are making a, a larger a barrier, larger gap between the two. So this is the, the, the junction axis is flipped here. I apologize. I took this uh, picture from a different source. But um, this is uh, essentially what's going on. You have a pileup of electrons here, a pileup of holes here. And to, if you want to calculate current going through, you want to calculate of uh, diffusion of charges this way, diffusion of charges this way, and the same in the valence band. So there are four terms. And at equilibrium, they are all balanced, and there is no current. So at equilibrium, current is equal zero, and it must be the case for the applied voltage uh, equals zero. So voltage applied to the N and P side, like in the battery diagram that I showed. And then uh, for forward bias, you're just bending the bands this way, and uh, you are reducing this potential hill here, and all these electrons that were bottled up there, they're going to rush, rush forward, and all these holes are going to rush backward, but the current will be flowing in the same direction because holes traveling this way is like electrons traveling this way. 
and therefore there'll be an electrical current. Um, and so if you plot the current voltage characteristic of a diode, then for forward bias, you're going to have a strong increase in current uh, with, with voltage. And for uh, reverse bias, you're going to have a very low current, maybe a little bit negative current, but a very low current. So this is a nonlinear element, uh, one, of the, one of the most commonly used ones. And uh, one very nice device you can build with it is a so-called rectifier, right? So you can change the AC signal into a DC signal with a diode. So this is a very simplified view of a rectifier. Diode is um, here, and uh, the direction of arrow is the direction of forward bias, meaning this way current can flow back current does not flow. That's the reverse bias, and you hit this depletion region. You cannot pass charges that way. Um, so if you apply a sine wave to this circuit, if you just have a diode, only the positive lobes of the sine wave are going to make it through. So this makes it through. This doesn't. This makes it through. This doesn't. This makes it through. This doesn't. So you go from bidirectional oscillation to a unidirectional oscillation. If you add an RC filter, you can slow down the AC uh, current, and you can start approaching a constant level, some kind of a DC, DC signal with a little bit of a wiggle. So that is a, this is not actually a practical rectifier circuit. Um, a more commonly used element is a bridge like this. Uh, in this case, uh, for the positive lobe, you go here. For the negative lobe, you can go through this diode. And uh, then a resistor that is hooked up in, at these points uh, gets both, but now flipped in the same direction. Then if you add to that an RC filter, you're going to get a, a nice DC signal. And that's, that's something you have in every device where you want to go from the, from the socket in the wall, where you have AC, to uh, something like a PC, where you need a DC voltage. Uh, all these kind of devices go from AC to DC, have some kind of a rectifier. Sometimes, uh, lately, they are more advanced than this, but in the past, people actually used these kind of things. Okay, so diode uh, rectifier, PN junction. Light emitting diode, right? It's a diode, so it has P and N, uh, and it emits light. So, how does that work? Uh, well, this is the same band structure uh, along the diode, along the junction direction, along the PN junction. Um, and now uh, what we're going to do is very similar to the quantum well laser, which I showed you for a heterostructure, but now with a PN junction. So with a PN junction, we send, uh, try to send the current this way, uh, so electrons go through. They maybe are not allowed to hop over the barrier and continue to travel through the junction here, they are stuck. But right at this point, they can recombine with a hole. They can recombine with a hole. And this recombination results in the emission of a photon. So this is a light emitting diode. So this is not a laser because this is not such a coherent process in a, in a in a PN junction, you can have a thermal, thermal uh, distribution of energy here. Uh, so en uh, then, uh, number of particles versus energy is a Fermi uh, distribution. And so you can have a, a, quite a spread in the energies of photons that are emitted. But they will have some kind of a predominant color based on the width of that distribution. And that's why you can have red LEDs, uh, blue LEDs, uh, so the band gap, the EV here, the band gap, uh, does play a role. And uh, if you make uh, light emitting diodes from different materials, you can tweak the color. So for example, uh, with gallium arsenide, um, you can have, um, I think uh, gallium arsenide is something like um, uh, one electron volt, so that's uh, a bit uh, too small uh, to emit uh, in the visible. But if you do this gallium arsenide phosphide, 
then you can uh, create a, a red LED. So you dope uh, gallium arsenide with phosph phosphorus atoms, uh, and you increase the band gap, and you can emit in red. Uh, the, uh, the famous LEDs are blue ones. Uh, there was even a Nobel Prize, I think, recently. And they are these nitrite materials. So gallium nitrite uh, gives you a blue color. So uh, this uh, is a very nice segue into the topic of band gap engineering. So a lot of the semiconductor industry is focused on this band gap engineering concept. And this is not only about uh, lattice mismatch, although you can see in this picture lattice constant versus band gap. And both are important. So for example, if some compounds are on the same axis, like here gallium arsenide and germanium, that means they have the same lattice constant. And going this way tells you what the difference in band gap is going to be. So this is a very convenient plot for seeing if two, two materials are. It's like a match.com for uh, semiconductors. Um, but a more interesting thing is uh, these green lines that connect the dots. So those are lines along which you continuously uh, change the stoichiometric ratio from one element to the other. For example, you start with germanium. And you go to silicon. So on one end, you have 100% germanium. On the other hand, you have 100% silicon. In between, you have silicon germanium. You have an alloy. And the band gap of that alloy uh, can actually depend on concentration. So if we, if we had little numbers here, like 10, 20, 30, 90, and so on, uh, we could be able to tell what the band gap uh, is uh, for a certain, certain alloy. But roughly, these lines tell you sort of halfway between indium arsenide and indium antimonide, you're going to have this lattice constant, and you're going to have this band gap. And, and so for example, for an LED, if you want a certain color, what you need to do is figure out what band gap uh, offset you want between the two semiconductors, uh, and then pick the materials from this table and see if they are a good epitaxial match if you want a high quality one. And this is how people do band gap engineering, tweaking the properties of semiconductors by uh, not only doping them, but also by, t by making ternary alloys of three different materials or, two dif or a binary alloys of two different materials. OK, solar cells, very important. That's, uh, also a multi-billion dollar industry by itself. And uh, much of it is based on semiconductors, although other type of solar cells are explored. When it comes to semiconductors, it is once again just a PN junction. Solar cell is a PN junction. Uh, now uh, it is something like the opposite of uh, the light emitting diode. The solar cell is something where a photon comes in, and then excites an electron hole pair in the PN junction. Now, what is the nice thing about PN junction is that in a PN junction like this, the electron will want to travel this way when there are too many electrons, it cannot go this way, and the hole will travel the opposite way. So if a photon hits somewhere around this area of the junction, then you have this charge separation. And this is crucial for the solar cell to work. If you just absorb a photon and electron and hole just stick around, they're going to recombine and the photon is going to come back. You're not going to get a current. And what you want from a solar cell is to absorb a photon and get a current. And that's where PN junctions give you the efficiency, give you the yield. So rather than recombining, they, they provide a way for carrying electron and hole away and giving you a current. So this is a, this is a design of one of these. There is an n-type contact, a p-type contact, and there is this uh, region which is the most important one because if the photons get absorbed there, then you have an effect. If they are get absorbed in the p-contact or in the n-contact, there, no, uh, there is no effect.
One more type of contact that is a building block in many devices, and sometimes uh, wanted, sometimes unwanted, is uh, a Schottky barrier, which is uh, something that happens when you try to combine a metal and a semiconductor. So we talked about heterojunctions or PN junctions uh, between two types of semiconductor. Now metal and a semiconductor try to put them together. This is what happens. Uh, metals and semiconductors are very different because in a metal we are in the middle of the band and we have a huge density uh, of particles. Uh, so you have uh, essentially an infinite source of charges. Uh, semiconductor is a, um, almost an insulator with a little bit of density. Uh, you put the two together, uh, there is a, always some mismatch between the Fermi levels in one and the other. For some surface science reasons, for the work function reasons, again, I will suppress these uh, for this lecture. This is a subject for a separate course, perhaps. But there is some mismatch in the chemical potentials. That's believable, right? Uh, two different materials, very different chemistry, different crystal structure, different electron density. Why should they have the same chemical potential, right? So there will be a mismatch. And what will happen uh, due to this mismatch is charges are going to want to go. So for example, in the example here, uh, these charges here are going to get sucked into the uh, metal. Uh, there, there are just an infinite number of states in this metal for these charges to go. And they will just, uh, these uh, do, uh, uh, donor charges will just go. Uh, and that will create, it will happen until there is some potential buildup that prevents them from going. Right? And so uh, this will take a form of something like this. Uh, there will be uh, something like what happens in a PN junction. There will be a band bending in a semiconductor. Uh, until the chemical potentials in metal and semiconductor are equilibrated, but there is, this, there is this region with pluses and minuses here signifying that there are no free carriers there in a semiconductor. And if you go through a calculation, uh, this is the calculation based on a, just a diffusion equation. So diffusion of some density of uh, particles is proportional, to, uh, gradient of density is proportional to the density itself. Uh, it can uh, give you a, an expression for, a electro for, a, for the electrical potential in terms of the density that you, uh, that you have. Uh, and if you work out um, on what scale that electrical potential decays to uh, the equilibrium value, you get this uh, x. I'm going through this a little fast. I apologize. But this essentially just solving a... Uh, Poisson equation and a diffusion equation and figuring out uh, the distance on which uh, this relaxes, you will get that for an energy offset of something like a half an electron volt, which is realistic, you can have a depletion region of hundreds of nanometers. So what you can think about uh, then is that you have put an insulator between the metal and the semiconductor, and the size of that insulator, uh, due to this effect of uh, band bending and depletion screening, is hundreds of nanometers. So it is very large. It is impossible for electrons from metal to just jump over this. This is too far for them to jump. This is about 10 times the wavelength. And so you can imagine if, if you have the evanescent wave function tail, it is exponentially suppressed across such a large barrier due to this band bending. So this is a, uh, this is a serious problem. If you want to contact a semiconductor with a metal, for example, for a transistor, if you want to source electron as a drain electron, uh, this is not such a problem for a gate. This works great for a gate electrode because you want that separated from your two-dimensional gas, for example. Uh, but this is something that oh, very frequently uh, gets discussed in semiconductor physics, and so I wanted to uh, let you know about it. Okay, in the last uh, section of today, we are going to talk about uh, this metal oxide semiconductor technology uh, just because it is so important. So conceptually, we already know everything to understand it. 
Uh, but because this is the backbone of most of semiconductor industry right now, uh, it's worth discussing it explicitly. So uh, it is uh, abbreviated as MOS, and a structure shown here is a MOS FET, which is a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. So it is a three terminal device with a source, drain, and a gate. Uh, very similar to the high mobility transistor I showed you at the beginning of the lecture, uh, but uh, it works with PN junctions. So it works a little bit different than uh, the other one. So the way it works is you have two PN junctions here, uh, one here and one here. And so the way, you, the way you do this is you start with, for example, a P-doped region, and then you create two N-doped regions in it by, for example, implantation of ions there. Sometimes that's how it's done. And then you grow um, a layer of oxide. Oxide is this thing here. Oxide is here, and that is the, the gate dielectric. So this is the thing that keeps the gate away from this, this silicon. Maybe there is a Schottky barrier, but maybe you don't want to rely on it. You want to make sure a good operation of a transistor put explicitly a dielectric here. And that stands for the O. M for the metal is the gate. So you have metal oxide semiconductor going along this direction, metal oxide semiconductor. You can also make a PNP transistor. In this case, you will have an N-doped region here and two P regions left and right. Uh, and those are uh, complementary. You actually need both of them uh, sometimes to, to make it work. So you just start with a piece of silicon and you create regions of different doping in it. Uh, and then you produce these other layers, oxide, contacts, and so on. So this is how this transistor works. Uh, you apply a positive gate voltage. So this is gate. You apply a positive gate voltage. And locally, around here, uh, you reverse this P layer into an N layer. You apply such a large voltage that uh, you, put so, you attract so many electrons into it uh, that the chemical potential goes into the conduction band and it becomes an N layer. And in this case, we have N, N, N. Uh, and the, this little dash here shows that there is a conduction path between the two Ns. Electrons can just rush through N, N, N. So that's transistor working. Uh, and uh, if you apply a negative voltage here, uh, then it's going to keep being a P. And then you have two PN junctions, right? And when you have two PN junctions, it's like having two diodes working like this. So this is for a negative input. You have essentially two diodes. So N, P, N is like two diodes. And then no current can flow because yeah, if you try to flow this way, you hit the first diode, you go through, then you hit the other diode, and you cannot go. There is a depletion region. And if you try to go the, the other way, you go through the first diode, but you cannot go through the second. So that's a blocked current situation. So this is uh, how you can um, start building uh, logical elements uh, from this. And these, these are foundation of our computing and our memory uh, in our computers, solid state memory. Uh, this is uh, typically uh, used. It's a complementary MOS transistor. And that's where you have both N type and P type. That is, that is called complementary. And that has various advantages. So then it's, uh, for example, a structure like this, where this is the in and this is the out. So this is a, the logic of the circuit will be that you put something at in either plus or minus, and there will be either plus or minus at the out. So if you in is equal to plus, then the N channel device is open, the P channel device is closed, and that means that the battery here is connected like this if we put a plus here. And then if you put a minus, then it's the other way around. And so 
the output voltage changes depending on the input. And they, this is the kind of thing you need to create to, uh, to build the logic circuits. This is a, uh, a schematic of a logic gate. So uh, with this kind of setup, here you have uh, four transistors. You can perform an uh, operation called n end. Uh, so the way it works is uh, here they call input uh, minus, uh, minus input as 0 uh, and then uh, in plus uh, input as 1. Uh, and the way it works that if A and B are both 1, so both inputs 1, so both are positive, you put positive charge here and you put positive charge here, uh, then uh, P channels are off and N channels are on, so can, can pass through. Uh, and that means that out is negative. So out will be negative. And in any other situation, the out is positive. So I'll, I'll leave you with working out how this works, but the, the basic idea is the one from the previous slide. You connect this, the battery potential minus or plus, to the output depending on the inputs. Uh, right? And so this is how you can perform a logic operation. You prepare two inputs, and depending on what they are, the output changes. This is the, the building block of any computer algorithm uh, that you can think of. So these things have been scaled up, and it's called integrated circuit. Uh, this is a uh, typically these days, it's a 12-inch it's a semiconductor wafer that they print at Intel with nanofabrication out of silicon with N and P doped regions and metal contacts. And then they chop it up into several uh, chips, which then go into your uh, laptops and so on. Uh, they are filled with these MOSFETs. They're all just filled with these MOSFETs uh, uh, combined into millions and, and uh, hundreds of millions of transistors. Uh, so this uh, thing does logic on chip already, already built in and allows for a huge flexibility in algorithms. For the last few moments, I want to mention one more device, CCD. Right? That's called, that stands for charge coupled device. But the name, uh, I think, is really poor. I guess it had some, it made some sense to people. Uh, back back when it was designed, uh, charged coupled device is a is a uh, is a pixel in your digital camera. It uh, uh, records the images, uh, and the way that does it it does it is also with a PN junction. So it is a little cell which is a, has a PN junction, and uh, there is, there are some gates. So it's a MOS structure. It has a layer of dielectric here. Black is metal and green is uh, green and gray is a semiconductor. Uh, and it is designed in such a way that there is this kind of an electrical potential which has a maximum somewhere around here. That's a high potential. That's how it's designed. You can enhance this potential by applying a gate. Uh, but that is one pixel of a digital camera. Uh, now these are, ooh, it's animation. Uh, these are several pixels. Pixels are controlled just by the gates. And what happens when electrons hit, the, uh, photons hit this structure, there is a photoelectric effect like the, uh, like the solar cell action. But now it's spatially resolved. So if photons go here to this pixel, then charges also get separated, holes and electrons get separated over that potential bump that I showed you. But because the potential has a maximum, electrons get attracted and they get stuck. They get stuck in this volume. So electrons, negative particles, go to the maximum of the electrical potential and get stuck here. And here you have a little bit more, and here you have a little bit less. So these two pixels will have a different intensity. Then there is a very nice, sophisticated way for how to read these out. But that is basically done with a charge meter, with like a galvanometer, a glorified galvanometer. So. It goes, uh, goes around and measures charge on all the pixels. Actually, pixels get delivered to, to the amplifier. Uh, but I don't have time to explain that to you. Uh, 
Well, maybe I, I spend 30 seconds on it, uh, actually. So uh, pixels are here. And uh, these uh, stripe lines are gates. Uh, and uh, by manipulating these gates, you take one row of pixels and unload them onto these, onto these guys, onto these islands of semiconductor. And then you shift them one by one into this amplifier. And it measures every time a current. Uh, and that records the, each pixel. So you acquire an image. You fill this up. And then you shift them row by row down. and then feed them into the amplifier. And so there is a sophisticated sequence of pulsing these gates for first acquiring the image and then reading it out one pixel at a time in the amplifier. And that's how your uh, digital camera works. And this is how it looks. So this is the image area. It's a solid piece of semiconductors, and pixels are just defined by gates. So there is a, it's a bulk PN junction. Gates just set up uh, the rest, and the amplifier is here. And this uh, strip line is how pixels get fed into the amplifier. Um, this is, by the way, the slide I already showed you with, uh, with the modern integrated circuits. But now you can understand better what is shown here. This is a zoomed out view. But each one of these elements is millions of transistors. So this is the silicon germanium. This channel is, for example, the the N or P region. There is source, there is drain, there is gate. Uh, all of it is at a nanometer scale. But the, what it started from was something much less glorious. This is the first transistor built in 1947. It's actually not a field defect transistor. It's uh, slightly different. It does have two PN junctions, uh, but there is no gate. The, the third electron is called a base. Uh, and this is the first integrated circuit. Uh, so somehow it made it from this into this huge, uh, huge industry. All right. So I'm going to stop here, and I'll see you next week.